in solidarity economy. And how did the ideas that you sort of started bouncing around here connect to sort of a bigger vision of what our communities can look like? Well, this, the classroom isn't just like teaching the topic at hand, but it's also teaching citizenship. And so I think that the classroom should extend in that manner, being aware of that. Well, I think another big piece of this, right, is, um, you know, talking about access and how we make, like, <clears throat> learning and education accessible to all students. So, I know you talked about students getting more out of schools, um, and Sarah Garns spoke a lot about the experience, well, this personal experience, but also um, the experience of, like, people who are differently able than, like, neurotypical or like able-bodied students um, and I think that like a big part of dem democratizing education is making sure that we are making presenting curriculum in a way that is accessible to everyone in our classrooms so whatever that means differentiating instruction if you have like heterogeneous classrooms like classrooms with people with a wide range of abilities and skill levels or you know incorporating you know, things for visual learners and things for audio learners, things for people who like to learn by reading and things by people who like to learn by moving around um, so that everyone can learn and your content is accessible to all your students. Um, and I think that that's like a really important and like crucial piece to um, any sort of like democratic Picking up on the idea of citizenship, in my day, uh, one idea is being a citizen of your in your classroom is one thing. Enabling the kids in your classroom to become citizens outside the classroom as well. So if there are projects like we're doing in Time <coughs> Bank in uh, Rhode Island, uh, Eastern Connecticut, and most of that where right now is in the hands of adults, but we should bring that project into the high school, the middle school, and even the elementary school so that the students there begin to learn how they can cooperate with their needs and their skills with the rest of the community that they're taken seriously even though they're only six or nine or 12 years old. So empowering students to be citizens right from the beginning, not expecting them to learn citizenship when they're 18, mm -hmm. but when they're, uh, if they're in school and they're compelled to be in school, then at least we give them the opportunity to learn how to utilize their skills for the I guess for me, I think that in the short term, when I said teachers, we need to stop defending and become proactive as to the type of education we want to see. And in the long term, the way we fund education needs to be dismantled and reconstituted. So until that happens, all we're going to do is stop gap solutions, which is fine and it is what it is. But I think like a complete overhaul needs to happen. Um, and so that's the way I see it tying in. I don't see education treated as a separate issue when we're talking about the solidarity economy. I see it as the backbone. Mm -hmm. So I think um, we really need to give some real thought as to mm -hmm. if we're going to reconstitute society, how do we form education so that it's meaningful instead of piecemeal? Because I went to a charter school, and it was great, and it, I, I was able to graduate high school because it saved me. But you know, right now when we talk about access to like Sunderland or like these great programs, all it is for me is a program for wealthy students who have the ability to make that choice as opposed to you know if we let if we didn't have compulsory education we don't give people resources we need to give in order to get so it needs to be a whole kind of complete vision i completely agree with what you said what you asked. i think that like there's like definitely like a an overhaul needed of like our public education system because i currently the way it's currently set up i don't think it's meeting um many, many 
met many, many people's needs. Um, and I think like what, what you shared earlier about like your experience as a teacher in the school where you are now, um, I think is becoming like very much more common that like more schools are kind of like adopting this model where, you know, what you teach, like teachers have very little autonomy and like are allowed very little, you know, self-determination as to how you, you know, build your own curriculum or what you're teaching in your own classroom. And um, I just, I think that that totally undermines like one's ability to teach their students. Um, and I think that like education, public ed needs to move in absolutely the opposite direction where like, um, you know, teachers do have the autonomy to determine, you know, I know my students, I know my classes, I know my kids, I know, and like I'm gonna work with them and with their families to determine like what works best for this individual child. Um, so just to make sure that uh, we can go get some food. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry to get a food package. Um, I was wondering if we could just all go around and just share something that we can take from this conversation and apply in our own work in building sort of a green solidarity economy, whether it's in the classroom, outside of the classroom, and in the um, So for me, I, I know I'm going to be a lot more sensitive to differently able folks in the classroom and trying to really challenge my own notions of neurotypical behavior and learning. Um, inspiration from the back. Um, <clears throat> lots of stuff. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Um, yeah, trust in the learning environment. Um, um, just like being comfortable in like, yeah, um, classrooms and like interacting with your teachers and stuff. Mm -hmm. That's about it.
only other thing I would suggest is to think about what it would look like for local communities, neighborhoods even, to create or recreate their own educational system. So that whatever their particular needs and skills are would be involved in that process. Uh, we have this movement across the world now called transition towns. Mm -hmm. And some of you may know about that, but there's something like 3,000 of them and they only started maybe five, six years ago in a small town called Totnes in England. Um, and quite an amazing movement uh, based on a lot of things that we all agree would be part of the solidarity economy. And to build a university or a learning center or community learning space within the scope of a transition town might be a, a way. I can't do it all at once. But I know in my part of the world, we had two towns that just decided that it would be transition town. Uh, right in the same neighborhood. In Western Mass, there are dozens of them. Uh, and to bring these thoughts and some of the other thoughts into the mix of transition town and solidarity economy might be a strategy for moving towards that uh, freedom and solidarity economy. I think I, I will also thank you um, for uh, reminding me that just because I have this ideal in my mind of having every student voice their thoughts and feelings, I really need to pay more attention to helping them get maybe some skills to begin with and a safe environment to begin with, knowing how to express themselves. Um, and I'm also really excited about figuring out how to collectively build a curriculum with my students. Um, and, and thinking about what I just said in that process. Thank you guys so much. Thank I think you. This was a really productive conversation. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know our contact information is on something somewhere. We had to give it. But uh, these are things that <coughs> we've been wrestling with and applying in our classrooms for a while. And so if you want to reach out with specific questions, techniques, things, please don't hesitate. Thank you, thank you. Um, actually, I see, I saw your name. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't know. I'm going to start this off. Just finding... Uh...